Okay, let's begin. Okay. So don't forget that there is an online quiz this week. It is posted and you have until tomorrow midnight to complete it. The lab this week is about bones. And as I said on Tuesday, my advice is that you spend time seeing the bones, make sure you identify the bones correctly and all the bone features and everything. The lab report contains a detailed list, list of all the structures, markings that you need to identify and also remember about the spelling, it's important. Yes? The lab report, you mean? Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And these labs, I mean, this week and the next week lab, it's all about bones. Today we're doing a skull, and the next week we're doing the vertebral column and the thoracic cage. And I think you have plenty of time in the lab to make sure you identify everything and take your notes and everything for, uh, in preparation for the exam. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish this second part of the study of the bone tissue. And last lecture, we described what are the main parts of a bone, the different shapes of the bones. We also studied the histology of the bone tissue. Um, we know that there are two types of tissue, which are compact and spongy bone. And under the microscope, we can identify the detail uh, structure of the osteons, which are the units of the bones, the cells, we discussed what are the cells that form bone and what are the cells that destroy bone, osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteoclasts. And the last part of the lecture on Tuesday, we started talking about ossification, which is the way that the bones develop and how we produce bone. Uh, especially when we are in a growth process. And we started describing one of the mechanisms of ossification, which is the membranous or intramembranous ossification. We described two types of ossification, intramembranous and endochondral. So the intramembranous is typical of the flat bones and the endochondral typical of the long bones. Now, there are some bones which are irregular. They have flat parts and they have some parts that look more like a long bone or a small bone. Uh, this is just a general description. That doesn't mean there is no, uh, in some bones there may be two types of ossification, endochondral intramembranous. But for a typical long bone, let's say like the femur, we can tell it's endochondral ossification mostly. Or, if we get a bone, typical flat bone, like the cranial bone, then we can say it's an intramembranous ossification. So, we described how this happens, and now it's time for the next mechanism, which is endochondral ossification. The endochondral ossification is typical of the long bones. And it involves replacement of cartilage by bone. The cartilage gets ossified. The cartilage uh, deposits the calcium. And how this happens, we describe that there are two centers in the bone which are called um, centers of growth or centers of ossification. There are two. One of them is called primary and the other one is secondary. And we'll see how this happens. If we see the template of a cartilage like this, it's all blue, that means all cartilage. And this happens when we are in embryonic development, fetal development. Everything is covered and surrounded by perichondrium, 
which we said is the membrane that covers the cartilage, perichondrium. We, in the case of the lone bone, we can recognize the different parts, diaphysis, epiphysis, proximal, and distal epiphysis. And in the middle, in the diaphysis, we start seeing this formation of kind of cells or places where the bone will start being ossified. As progressively we see, here in the center part is where the chondrocytes will start depositing calcium. And the blue substance that we see starts getting calcified. We see the extracellular matrix is getting calcified around the diaphysis of the long bones. Nutrient artery, that's the blood vessel that enters into the bone. This is the moment that this nutrient artery starts getting into the inside of the bone. And we see two layers, since this is a longitudinal section, we see two parts that are ossified. Well, this, that happens, that's happening all around the diaphysis. It's getting calcified. At first. Now, the second thing that happens is that this central part, which is called the primary ossification center, we see the nutrient artery invading at that point, getting calcified and the chondrocytes that starts growing in these directions to both epiphyses and the long bone starts to grow in length. Yes. So the nutrient artery, artery gets calcified in the bone? The nutrient artery enters into the bone still when this cartilage and everything around the nutrient artery gets calcified. That's why when we see the adult bone, we see a hole when that's where the nutrient artery is going in. And so this bone is growing. And if we focus on one of the epiphyses, and one of the parts of the epiphyses, and the limit between the diaphysis and epiphysis, we can see that the extracellular matrix continues being calcified. And at the same time, the bone is growing in this direction. And at the same time it's growing, it's getting calcified. And the bone keeps growing in length and getting harder um, with deposits of calcium. And there is a part here, you see all these rows or columns of cells that look like coins, a stack of coins. Those are chondrocytes. They'll keep growing and growing and growing. Since they are not yet calcified, they still can grow and deposit more extracellular matrix and little by little it'll get calcified and the bone keeps growing. And then all of a sudden we see that in the epiphysis there is a secondary ossification center. So groups of cells will start calcifying the cartilage here and this is called the secondary ossification center center. So we have primary center here around the diaphysis, secondary ossification center in the epiphysis. And these cells will grow in this direction and this ossification center since it starts like in a circle, it starts growing in a radial way. So it, when it, it direction to the diaphysis and it starts growing the bone starts growing in both directions and little by little the area this area which is still cartilage will get smaller and thinner and thinner and thinner until we see this and that's how the epiphyseal plate is cartilage because it's just a remain it's just that part in between the epiphysis and diaphysis now that we see it's in between the primary uh, ossification center and the secondary ossification center, this epiphyseal plate. And the cartilage, the portion of cartilage that remains in this area will be the articular cartilage. Yes. Are the blue dots still Yes. They say chondrocytes. As long as there are or there is cartilage, there will be chondrocytes. And the chondrocytes keeps growing. 
they keep growing and uh, that's how we uh, grow until all the cartilage of the epiphyseal plate is calcified then there's no chance for more growth and we have the whole summary of all the process with the description here summarizing long bones endochondral uh, ossification there are two ossification centers primary around the shaft or diaphysis and secondary in the epiphysis and they grow making like leaving a remain a line of epiphyseal plate which will get calcified when the growth is complete and the bone is completely calcified the only part of cartilage that remains after is the articular cartilage which will be the part participated in a joint to this point yes It, it remains as cartilage. That part remains as cartilage. Secondary. It will never get calcified. The, second. the secondary ossification center, yeah, it starts growing. It starts in a little circle, and that circle starts growing and growing and growing, running, uh, growing in different directions. If it grows in direction to the diaphysis, it will meet the, the, the primary ossification center that are coming closer also. But the, the part that is covering the epiphysis of the bone will remain as articular cartilage always. So the growth occurs until this age, in average, 18, 21 years of age. And I said in average because some people keeps growing even after 21, which is not common. Some people stops growing at 17 or 18. It's not only about amount of cartilage, it's about hormones. We will see that there's a hormone called growth hormone, which stimulates growth in these bones. And now we see in the x-rays. This is the same x-rays that we showed uh, last Tuesday, they're magnified. If we draw the bone, it will be something like this. The epiphyseal plate, seeing it's a black line, and all that black area is cartilage, it's still cartilage. And here, this is the articular cartilage and the epiphyseal plate or cartilage in between. If we see an x-ray like that, we can tell this person is still a kid or a young person, a young adult, depending on how thick or thin the epiphyseal plate is. At least we can say that person is still growing. Perhaps we will not be so accurate about the age, but we can tell that, that person is still growing. There are sometimes people that come or uh, uh, people that bring their and children and uh, the children are really short and they ask the doctor why my my kid uh, my kids not growing some disease or some problem and the first thing a pediatrician does is to take an x-ray to see if there's epiphyseal plate if there's still epiphyseal plate that means there is something else perhaps they need some more hormone growth hormone but if they see that there's no epiphyseal plate nothing else to do they completed the growth they're short they probably remain like that as I said before there are many other factors that can um, stop growth at some point uh, some substances may be toxic and, and damage that cartilage which is an adult and which is a, a, a young person a kid A, a is an adult a is a kid. Look at this. You see the epiphyseal plate there. This guy is not growing anymore. A is still growing. B is not growing anymore. And if you see, in B, we see the epiphyseal line. We see a white, thicker line. Perhaps you don't see it very well in the projection, but... If you see the picture in the in the PowerPoint, you will see better. So that's how we, as I said, at least we can say that person is still growing. That person is not growing anymore. It's an adult.
And that's how sometimes when they get uh, or when you find when they find remains or human remains, like in mummies and this type of uh, uh, remains, they take X-rays and still can see if there's a pivotal plate. There's no more cartilage, but at least that part will. I mean, it's not bone. It's not bone, and we can tell the age of the person. As I said, there are more things, not only cartilage and growth of the cells. Hormones are important. Hormones like the growth hormone, the complete name is human growth hormone. We usually call this H, G, H. And this hormone that is produced by the pituitary gland stimulates bone growth, muscle growth, loss of fat, increased glucose output in the liver, which means this hormone increases the metabolism, accelerates, speeds up the metabolism so we can, the cells can grow. But at the same time for growth, energy is required. So glucose is taken from the liver and used as fuel for energy. Human growth hormone is produced not only in kids, it's produced in everyone, even though we're not growing anymore, but we still have growth hormone. Our bones will not grow anymore, but still it has metabolic effects. It helps us to get or increase our metabolism. Growth and remodeling, these two processes happen at expense of the osteoblast and osteoclast work. There must be a balance all the time. Balance between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. The osteoblasts produce the bone and osteoclasts remodel the bone. And so all the time we keep the shape of the bone. Sometimes we can make our bones stronger. Let's say if we start exercising, working out, lifting weights, your muscles will be stronger, but at the same time they will start pulling the bone, the tendons will pull the bone, and so the bones need to be more strong. More calcium will be, cal will be deposited. That is remodeling, that's why it's called remodeling, because according to our needs, there will be more or less calcium. You probably have heard the people that go to um, astronauts, they go to the uh, special stations, they they suffer decalcification of the bones because of the lack of gravity. The gravity is weight. The, the bones have to support the weight of the body. If there's no gravity, there's no need for calcium, and the calcium is reabsorbed. When they come back, after being three months, six months sometimes, they come back with osteoporosis. And here in the gravity again, they, they, they recover the calcium they lost. That is remodeling. Sometimes, and this is pathologic, this is abnormal, the bones become abnormally thick and heavier. That's a disease that we will study in the endocrine system called acromegaly. And in osteoporosis, the bones get weaker because of the lack of calcium, that's the action of the osteoclasts um, is increased. There's another problem here called rickets and osteomalacia. In this case, what happens is that the bones become soft. In what way? Well, the bone is matrix, extracellular matrix, which is calcified. But if the extracellular matrix is deficient in proteins, collagen, it will not be properly calcified. And here the problem is the extracellular matrix. And therefore, the bone gets softer. We'll mention these diseases again when we get to endocrine system. I'll just mention it here as examples of bone problems. For the bone to grow or remodel, we need hormones, we need the cells, but we need the calcium. Minerals, calcium and phosphorus. And some others like magnesium, fluoride, manganese are minerals that they uh, are involved in the production of calcium and the production of bone. Vitamins. Vitamin A, for instance, stimulates osteoblasts. Vitamin C 
C for collagen. Vitamin C is important in the production of collagen. So if someone has a deficiency of vitamin C, there will not be enough collagen, the extracellular matrix will not be good, and the calcification will not be good either. And vitamin D, which we mentioned in the skin, is very important. It promotes the absorption of calcium from our intestines, so we can use the calcium that we eat every day in the formation of bone, growth and remodeling. And I was saying when we did this in the skin that children need vitamin D so they can deposit calcium in, the, uh, in their bones and therefore grow properly. Vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium at the intestines. So the calcium that we eat can be used effectively in formation of bone. These hormones that I'm mentioning, like the HGH, growth hormone, is very important during childhood for growth, as well as um, IGFs, which stands for growth factors, which are other substances produced by the liver, and they are very important to stimulate osteoblasts. So these osteoblasts will deposit calcium, um, chondrocytes from the epiphyseal plate keep dividing and making the bone grow more matrix is produced collagen protein synthesis not only growth hormone is necessary thyroid hormone is also necessary for bone growth insulin insulin that insulin that is needed for glucose intake and uh, diabetic people don't have yes What's that, IGFs? igfs growth factors the i stands for insulin like growth factor and it's called insulin like because it works like insulin it mobilizes glucose in uh, from the liver but that helps for increased energy consumption and therefore increase of the metabolism and thyroid hormones and insulin promotes also osteoblasts and uh, for protein synthesis. Sometimes we see, for instance, people that have diabetes type 1, which is more common in children, it's diagnosed very early, usually, and some of them, they don't, they don't grow too much. They don't have the insulin. The insulin is necessary for growth. Not a main role, but it is important to, for ins insulin to be present during the growth process. And sex hormones. I'm talking about estrogen and testosterone, female and male hormone. They have a dramatic effect during puberty, during puberty especially. Commonly called growth spurts, that event that happens during early teenagers, uh, early teens uh, time. Also, uh, girls grow faster than boys. If you go see uh, elementary school or middle school class, you will see the girls all tall and the boys a little short. And then they catch up, usually. But that's something that you see. That's called growth spurred because of the effect of the sex hormones. And also, depending on genetics, depending on amount of hormones, the stimulus, etc., well, the epiphyseal plate will be closed at the end of the puberty, which coincides usually at 18, 19, 20 years old. This growth spurts is seen in this way. Girls and boys, you see the girls are 12. This is this this uh, graph is just average, it's not exact or accurate. This is the growth in centimeters per year. The peak for girls usually happens at 12 year old, 11, 12 year old. And the peak for boys 
happens later at 15, 16 years old. Yeah. The reason why yeah. girls grow faster is because of the different type of stimulation of the hormones. The estrogen stimulates the, the, the growth of the pelvis, the growth of uh, bones, and at the same time stimulates the, the ovaries. But the testosterone, the testosterone uh, is produced in an uh, increasing way early puberty to start the production of sperm, but then later it increases later than a female. In female, it's important because as soon as the girls start with puberty, the ovaries start working and they produce more, more estrogen. In boys, it's different because pituitary gland sends the hormones to the testicles and the testicles start producing the testosterone at a different rate. It is, it's about the rate of production in so, ovaries and testes. No, this is the peak, so the maximum. Oh. Yeah, the maximum stimulation, <coughs> I'm sorry, on the bones. On the bones. Because these hormones are working uh, for the secondary sexual characteristics, or the adipose tissue, for the skin, for the reproductive organs, and it, it occurs at different times. Any other question? More hormones. There are more hormones involved here. PTH and calcitonin. PTH and calcitonin are two hormones that are related with the metabolism of calcium, just with the metabolism of calcium. And phosphorus. Calcitonin is produced by the thyroid gland. PTH stands for parathyroid hormone and is produced in these glands called parathyroid gland which is a small gland this is like just group four groups of cells that are right next to the thyroid gland that's why it's called parathyroid gland but there are two different groups of cells pth or that produce pth and cells from the thyroid that produce calcitonin and they have opposite opposite effects if the calcium levels get too high, let's start with this, that it stimulates production of calcitonin. And what the calcitonin does is promotes the process of calcium in the bone to control the level of calcium in the blood. If there's too much in the blood, well, the calcium is deposited in the bones. Decrease the uptake in the intestines. So we don't need more calcium from the diet. It won't be absorbed so efficiently. And decrease calcium reabsorption from the urine. If we eliminate calcium in the urine, um, we don't reabsorb it. We just lose it because there's too much in the blood. Those are actions of the calcitonin. And when the calcium levels falls, then is when the PTH it starts working. Parathyroid hormone, which increase the calcium release. If there is low calcium in the blood, we need calcium. And we have calcium in the bones. So the osteoclasts will release calcium from the bones. Release it to the blood. So muscle cells, nerve cells can use it. PTH increases uh, calcium uptake in the intestines. We need more calcium. We need to take it from the calcium that we, we are eating in the diets. And increase the reabsorption. If we are losing calcium in the urine, we reabsorb it. We re re retrieve it. We don't want to lose it. So in that way, calcitonin and PTH balance the levels of calcium in the blood. Yes. Exactly. And calcium and vitamin D. That's why they insist too much on the kids to drink milk. Because the milk contains vitamin D and calcium. 
both. And the calcium, to be effectively used, needs vitamin D. So both have to come together. We still need to take calcium in our diets, but not too much as in childhood. Okay. Yeah, if you don't drink milk, it's not a big deal. You can get uh, calcium from other sources. You can get it from the cheese, you can get it from ice cream, you can get it from other sources. Not only milk. Ice cream. Ice cream is a good source. Yeah, unless you have lactose intolerance, then you're in trouble. But that's, that's easy to fix because... At the same time you drink milk, if you have lactose intolerance, you take these enzymes, lactase. So it will help you to, uh, to digest the lactose. Yeah? So why is it a uh, patient with uh, kidney failure? Which hormone? The calcitonin, PTH? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because the kidney, if you remember one of the graphs that we show in the skin, uh, the met- metabolic pathways of vitamin D, how the vitamin D is produced and activated, there's one step that is necessary and that step happens in the kidney. So if the kidneys are like failing in someone, like a kidney failure, those kidneys are not healthy and they are not helping for the metabol- met- metabolism of vitamin D. And therefore, that will affect the metabolism of calcium. And that's how the kidneys are important in this. Yeah, this is the same, the same thing on a different diagram. The when the calcium levels are decreasing, then this is in terms of homeostasis. The receptors of the parathyroid gland will detect that, and uh, the reaction will be increased release of PTH, which increase the activity of the osteoclasts. So the calcium will be released from the bones to the blood. Or the kidneys retain calcium in the blood. We need more calcium. And because the levels were low. And these two actions will increase the blood calcium and go the negative fat feedback loop. In this case, uh, calcium homeostasis. Okay, let's talk about fractures. We know how the bone remodels, and uh, in the case of a fracture, there will be increased activity of these uh, mechanisms. The fractures can be defined simply when the bone breaks. But there are different ways and different mechanisms, but the uh, at which or how the, the, the bones break. The different ways, or different types of fractures are classified using different words. Maybe partial or complete. If the fracture is all the way through, the bone is complete. If it's not going through the whole length or the whole width, it is a partial fracture. Maybe classified as closed or open. If this, if it's closed, it's also called simple. Open because the skin is broken and you can see the bone outside. We say open fracture. Green stick. Green stick is like a small line. Like sometimes we say there's a fissure, there is just a crack in the bone. Other types of fractures are impacted, comminuted, spiral, or transverse. These are according to the mechanism, how the forces act on the bone, so the bone breaks in different ways. For instance, this is an example of a green stick fracture. A green stick. 
It's like a break in a green twig. It's like a branch of a tree. You try to break it, but instead instead of breaking it, you bend it. It breaks in one side, but the, the, the whole thing is just kind of bent. And that's sometimes, this is typical in kids and children, like six years old, five, six, seven years old. They come to the emergency with a usually forearm bent. You see, like, just bent. You see what happened? The bone is br broken? Well, not completely. And why it's like bent? Because it's still cartilage, it's still soft. And the cartilage was, in a way, kind of bent and not break completely. This is called green stick. Uh, you don't see this in adults. In adults, broken. Broken and you see it, two pieces, very clear. This is an example of impacted fracture. This happens in uh, the humerus sometimes. And you can see the fracture here, in that part of the humerus. Impacted when, let's say, um, you fall from uh, the second floor or from the roof and you land on your hands, on your upper limbs, or even lower limbs. And so the forces are applied in this way, in the longitudinal way, and the bone breaks at some point. Impacted fracture. That's according to the mechanism which they happen. This is an example of an open fracture, open or compound fracture. We don't get to see the skin here, but in a way we can see that the skin is like this. So a piece of the bone is showing up outside. This, this type of fractures are really complex because it takes a long time to heal. Besides, the fracture is complete. There is an open door for microorganisms, bacteria, and usually gets infected. It needs to be treated with antibiotics for a long time and, and the time plus the time the bone takes to heal it's easily three to six months of uh, treatment depending on the size the complexity of the bones of course and these are just other types like oblique there's a line is oblique spiral this type of spiral fracture can happen in sports sometimes or when they just twist your arm like this or your lower limb and and bone breaks in that way comminuted it stands for bone is shattered this is typical in gunshots you get a gunshot in the thigh and you're so lucky that the bullet went through your bone and your bone will be completely shattered or the humerus or and again, it takes a long time to heal because sometimes they have to put all the pieces together. They usually have to fix this in surgery. Using the screws, plates, metallic devices, rods, and different types. Yeah, they can like twist them. Get twisted. And sometimes you see them twisting like the, the, their arms. The first thing that breaks are the ligaments, of course, here in this way. Ligaments, tendons, and joints. But then the bones may break. The bones may break ultimately. The actual bone. The actual bone breaks. Sometimes we see this uh, when there are accidents at workplaces, or there are different types of machinery, and the bone of the arm gets trapped and get twisted, and see the bone is, is broken in that mechanism. All right, questions, comments at this point? Let's have a quick break, 10 minutes. Let's continue. So talking about fractures, we have to mention other types of fractures like pathologic fracture or stress fracture. 
Well, the difference is pathologic fracture, as the name says, is abnormal fracture, a fracture that happens in uh, situations where some other disease is present or bones that break in someone uh, which are unusual, like if you are walking in, at home in the living room and you stumble and fall, uh, you can get up and it hurts, but that's it. If your 90 year old grandma falls in the same way, man, the bones will break because the bones have osteoporosis. The bones are not normal, so that's called pathologic fracture. Or in people with different type of conditions in which the bones are weaker, uh, people with cancer, people with chronic diseases, um, and stress fracture is a fracture that happens when the bone is under continuous stress. Like people doing some type of sports that uh, continue doing some type of activity and get extreme and the bone breaks. The tennis elbow is more a ligament thing, but it may be a, a fracture. It may happen. Yes. Um, are stress fractures like the hairline ones? Or the yes, they're usually partial. They're not complete. They're usually partial, and uh, mm, yeah, there's no displacement. Mm. Yeah, it may heal with time. Sometimes they don't require anything that just. I mean, rest and bandages, depending on the anatomy and the muscles that are attached to that bone. The pathology fractures? No, whenever the bones are not normal, we can say. Like the bone has osteoporosis, the bone has a disease, uh, and that uh, increases the risk of having this fracture. There are some other fractures that have specific names and they happen under specific circumstances like these two Coles fracture of the radius, distal radius, or Potts fracture of the distal fibula in the lower limb. Uh, this, for instance, this Coles fracture type, distal radius, but sometimes the ulna is also compromised in this fracture. How this happens, this is typically when people fall from the roof and they try to try to protect the head and the face. They just put the hands and all the way to the body on the palms of the hand and these two bones, they just break and the pieces come through the skin and they come to the emergency like this and with the both bones showing up like, like two things like this. That's called a close fracture, which may be closed or open, depending on the severity of the... Uh, Hmm? Yeah, sometimes they are just overlapping, depending on the angle. But sometimes the piece breaks the skin and comes, it shows up. Yeah, either or. Maybe either one of the times. It's showing this mechanism. Some people compare this to the fork. It's the same angle that reminds us of the curves of a fork. Uh, but as I say, it may be closed or open. It can be seen also in uh, old, old people. I mean, with osteoporosis, they fall and they try to protect their heads or the, put the hand and all the way to the body there and break the bone having a cold fracture. And that's how it looks. This is a closed fracture. So you can see the curvature here. You can see the both, both bones. One of them overlapping and the other one, the pieces are displaced. Hmm? Um, that won't happen. That won't happen just by twisting the wrist. And uh, the treatment for this is usually surgery alignment and a cast around yeah they usually have to do to, to do uh, to go to surgery to fix this depending there's 
disalignment of the pieces of the bone. That's usually the moment when they have to go into put a screw, put a plate. Now going to the histologic aspects of the healing, what happens as long as this process of healing goes on? It's very predictable. And that correlates with the times I usually use in the treatments or how long a cast must be applied and how many weeks and all that correlates with the cycle of healing of the bones. And the initial treatment also, it correlates with the mechanisms that happen. The first step, six to eight hours after the injury, a hematoma, collection of blood under the periosteum. Imagine the bone is broken and there are many blood vessels in the central canal, the Volksbank's canal, and all those blood vessels are broken, ruptured, and it bleeds. And where the blood goes? Under the periosteum. It starts collecting under the periosteum, as we see here. And periosteum, we said, uh, it has nerve endings. It hurts. That's what usually hurts. And it starts swelling up. That happens in the first six to eight hours after the injury. And that's the reason also why when someone breaks a bone in council emergency, and they're, they're, after four hours of waiting, they start complaining, why is it taking so long to treat me? I mean, it's been four hours. Well, it's on purpose. You should wait until six hours. Why? It hurts. Okay, some painkillers. But do not apply any cast or do something because hematoma is still producing, blood is still collecting, and it's still swelling up. After six hours, we can assess very well and say, okay, bone is broken, we have the x-ray, and it's swollen, and we can say, okay, complete. The swelling, uh, swelling is complete, it's not going to swell anymore. And then we can go ahead and plan for the cast and the treatment long term, etc. And sometimes they take the x-rays and they come with the results after three hours. And why does it take so long, three hours, for reading an x-ray? Come on. We're just waiting. The torture in there. That's right. Patience. Well, that's usually what happens. And it usually correlates with, uh, with the rhythm of an emergency room where everything is just busy. And, and usually, okay, let's just wait. And then, Yeah. <laughs> Let's say someone comes to break a bone. You break a bone on the forearm or arm or the, the ankle or whatever, and take an X ray. And after thirty minutes, after the injury, it's okay. I know the bone is broken. Let's put a cast. And you put a cast. And after four hours, the patient starts complaining of pain, a lot of pain, and you see that the circulation in the hand is compromised because you apply the cast too early. Swelling is still going on, and it's all the tissues are trapped and compressed in the cast, and the blood vessels are compressed, and you have a, a bigger problem now. That's why it's better to wait until you know, some hours. And think it's better in terms of swelling. So that second and third step. That's in the following days and weeks after putting the cast. Yes. The swelling is the blood collecting under the periosteum and all the soft tissues around, all the muscles, fat tissue getting inflamed and everything is swelling. And this second and third step includes phagocytes, macrophages coming to the place, removing all the dead cells and blood, fibroblasts from the connective tissue start producing a collagen. Collagen and then it turns into fibrous tissue and what we call a fibrocartilage around the fracture. We call that callus. And all this substance that was red now is blue. It's blue because it contains fibroblasts, are producing collagen, fibrocartilage, second part of the healing process. And then the cartilage will be calcified. And now the bone is getting repaired finally. 
All this process usually takes about six weeks, eight weeks, depending on the bone, depending on the age, depending on the, how bad the fracture is. But in average, usually six weeks, eight weeks, maybe four weeks. Casts are usually applied for four weeks, sometimes less, but it depends. And when the fibrocartilaginous callus turns into bone, we call it now bony callus. Lots of osteoblasts producing more bone around the fracture site. And this is what we see in the sequence of uh, x-rays. Day one, fracture. Day four, this is taking a different angle. It's not getting worse. It's day one, day four is worse. It's a different angle of the x-ray. Day seven, look at this. Around the fracture, it's getting even worse. There's like a cloud around the, the site of fracture. That's the fibrocartilaginous callus. And then, you can see this thickening of the bone, now it's bony callus. And after six months, you don't even see a trace of the fracture. If the bone is repaired and remodeled as the initial shape. And here in this uh, x-ray on top, we can see the bony callus much better. This is a fracture of the radius and ulna. As you can see the thickening around the distal epiphysis or metaphysis, and uh, you can see the bony callus. So that's how we assess how the fractures are going. Even with the cast, we take x-rays, we see if the fibrocartilage callus is forming, if the bony callus is forming, and then we can determine when to remove the cast. Final steps takes months. At this point, you're healed, you can return to your activities, is it time for therapy, physical therapy, exercises perhaps. Spongy bone is replaced by compact bone. Fracture line disappears, but sometimes evidence of the break remains. That's a line, depending on the uh, how bad the fracture is. We can see a line afterwards, but it won't affect the function of the bone. And that completes the process of bone remodeling. Exercise in bone tissue. Bones require, so therefore the bones to grow and remodel require a good matrix, proteins, calcium, hormones, different types, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, PTH, calcitonin, and even needs the skin and the kidneys be working fine, so everything will tend into formation of bone, normal formation of bone. And during a lifetime, our bones are remodeled, replaced. If we are under stress, like exercising, doing some activity, the bones can get stronger because they are under stress by the muscles, the muscles pull and the bone grows more or gets remodeled. Is it true that the bone that gets remodeled is stronger than the previous bone that was there before? Yeah. People that play tennis, and sometimes there are studies that show that they have the bones thicker in the arm. If they use the right arm or left arm, the one that they use more, uh, the bones have more bone density because they have more calcium. You don't see a difference. I mean, you don't see a big arm. But if you measure the amount of calcium, you can tell that the bone has been remodeled. Aging process. With the aging process, what happens is loss of calcium, loss of bone mass. And that's what we call osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a, a, a process that involves many factors. One of them is loss of calcium, loss of enzymes, and lack of hormones like estrogen. Everyone has osteoporosis, male and female. Female, they have it at an increased rate. 
after 30 years old. After 30 years old, everyone has osteoporosis. And less degree, and then gets worse by the end of 40s, 50s, even worse after 60s. Collagen decreases with age also, and the bone becomes very susceptible to fractures. It can break at any time. That's what we call pathologic fractures in people with osteoporosis. And this is a view comparison on normal osteoporotic bone. You can see the bones are very weak, porous, and that's how we see these uh, trabeculae. This is a spongy bone because of the loss of calcium. It may happen because of lack of uh, intake of calcium in extreme situations like nutrition problems, uh, but it's not common. And this is what I was saying, osteoporosis happens in everyone. After 30 years old, you get an osteoporosis. But the rapid loss happens at this point, the 50s and 60s. And that's when many people have problems with the osteoporosis. And this picture will explain how people get smaller with the age. You shrink. You don't shrink. What happens is that the vertebral column loses its angle. The vertebrae, since they have less calcium, they collapse from being like, let's say, three centimeters tall. If there's not enough calcium, after some years it will not be three centimeters, it will be 1.5. And how many vertebrae we have? More than 30. And you add that effect, 30 times 1.5, you have 30 centimeters less along the age, along the time. And that's what happens. Initially we are like this, and then progressively we get shorter. And you see the, the thoracic cage and the pelvis. The thoracic cage, it gets closer to the pelvis. And look how they are. And what else? Look at the belly. It's flat here. We have more belly here. We have even more here. Sometimes we say, why well, my belly? My belly with the age. No, it's your vertebral column, the loss of angle that makes your belly appear more. And that's all the effects of osteoporosis. 55 years old, 65 years old, and 75 years old. Questions? Yes, yes scoliosis is a problem of a lateral deviation of the vertebral column. And it usually gets worse because the curvature, when we are young, is still moldable, it's still flexible. But then when you turn after 50s, 60s, it gets more rigid and less flexible. And when you are young, you can manage. But then it comes to a point where you stay like this permanently. Yeah. Okay, these are the questions for you. <laughs> questions? Huh? Sorry. Okay, answers to these questions. <laughs> Question number one. What is the explanation of the growth spurt seen in teenage year, years? Sex hormones. Sex hormones and a different type of a stimulation. They produce estrogen and testosterone in boys and girls. Number two. What is the effect of PTH and calcitonin on the bone cells and the levels of calcium in the blood? What the PTH does? Stimulates osteoblasts or osteoclasts? PTH. It's osteoclasts. And the calcitonin? 
osteoblasts. PTH is produced when the levels of calcium go low. Wait, PTH is osteoclasts. Osteoclasts. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> this way. This doesn't count. Yeah. Okay. Osteoclast and osteoblast. Opposite effects. PTH stimulates osteoclasts to release calcium from the bone and therefore go to the blood. And when the calcium is too high, calcitonin stimulates osteoblasts. So they take the calcium from the plasma and put it in the, in the bones. And what's the difference between osteoporosis and osteomalacia? Isn't osteomalacia the Malaysia? It's the softness, but that's normal in kids, right? Osteoporosis, less calcium. Osteomalacia, less matrix. That's the difference. Osteomalacia is softening of the bones because of Deficient matrix, less collagen, less proteins. Osteoporosis is more related with the calcium, less calcium. But both may cause pathologic fractures. Yes? And? The bones get very fragile. They can break easily in both cases. All right.